nice to have good things because well, about the study, it's not like the Prince of Egypt. I actually struggled a lot in the two reasons watching it. One, because I felt very humbled and repentful that you know I don't live up to the standard of all these central figures. But I also was struggling because from the Divine Principles perspective, it was a super rocky journey. It was so difficult. It was so long. And God just had to wait because it's our portion of responsibility that needs to be done for the providence to move forward. Because we've learned so far that this portion of responsibility is the principle of creation. And the way that we can fulfill that and grow ourselves to maturity, these three great blessings to be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over the earth, is to go through a three-stage growing process of formation, growth, and completion. And this is what our first human ancestors, Adam and Eve, were to do, so that they could establish a four-position foundation with God at the center, having a good relationship within themselves, their mind and body, having a good relationship with each other, and having a good relationship with the creation, so that with God at the center, the entire creation that God invested so much in could be a good object partner to God, where he could receive joy from the creation and all of us, and we could receive God's joy and his love, but that didn't happen because one of God's creations, the archangel Lucifer, was jealous and envious at the love that Adam and Eve were receiving from him. And so they fell. They didn't obey God's commandment, which was do not eat the food. Don't have a relationship with another person till you're mature. Because what happened was in their state of immaturity, they formed a four-position foundation centered on Satan, centered on more selfish love and you know false love. And this created the world we have today. You know, in the religious sphere, it's called the kingdom of hell. If you study history, it's just conflict, disorder, chaos. But God is our parent. That's the principle of creation. We're his children, and he's our parent. So a heavenly parent, the ideal parent of love, doesn't give up. He refuses to give up. So that's why immediately he commends the providence of restoration. where he seeks to raise our level of spirituality, morality, ethics through specific people, central figures that he sends throughout history who are kind of like a model of how to raise our level of morality to a certain degree until the point where he can send the Messiah, a person born of God's lineage, not of this lineage due to the fall, where he can be the 100% model, like Eva said, the 100% model of what it means to fulfill the three great blessings and find a bride and establish a true family. And then through the Messiah, we can be almost engrafted, we can be engrafted onto his lineage in a, in a sense so that we can be out of this midway position that we find ourselves in and go towards God completely and build this ideal, build this kingdom of heaven, fulfill the purpose of creation. But, and, and this is why we study figures such as Abel, Noah, and then most recently Abraham's family and Jacob. But what they've been trying to accomplish isn't just raising our level of spirituality and ethics specifically, it's to create a foundation for the Messiah. That's why our level of spirituality and morality needs to be raised to a degree so that when the Messiah comes, we're able to understand him, accept him. And... As we've been talking about, it requires a foundation of faith, which is doing what Adam couldn't do in the Garden of Eden, which was to obey God's commandment, follow God's guidance, follow the word. And then the foundation of substance, which is to reverse the fallen natures and the emotional reasons why the, there was a relational breakdown in the Garden of Eden of when false love entered the picture. And we've known that while the foundation of faith is, you know, is easier when compared to the foundation of substance and you know becoming one in heart, unifying with another person, restoring a relationship. It's very difficult. But Jacob was the first one to do this. And so because of that, he became a model for the rest of the central figures throughout history on how to win over Satan, how to restore both the foundation of faith and foundation of substance. And this is what the divine principle calls a symbolic model. Because then Moses, as we're about to study, raises this model 
to a more substantial model. The divine principle calls it an image. And then Jesus, the Messiah himself, which we'll study about later, is going to raise this to a substantial level. A substantial model where he, in reality, defeated Satan and had absolute faith in God and was one in heart with God to the point where Satan was defeated and gave us, because Jesus gave us spiritual rebirth. And so who is Moses? Who is Moses that God sent? Well, we can look at it from several perspectives. From a historical perspective, he was the leader who uh, brought the Israelites back to their homeland of Canaan. From a religious perspective, in Judaism, he is the most important prophet because Moses is the one who brought the law, the Jewish tradition. He brought everything to them. He led them out of slavery. So Moses is the most important figure in Judaism. And even in Christianity, he's considered one of the most highly revered prophets. Same with Islam. And from the divine principle perspective, he's very important because he's described as a prefigure to Jesus. Because he's trying to model the way to subjugate Satan. And he's also trying to bring, give Jesus the clearest path to victory. Because we learned that even though Jacob was successful, it was only at the family level, family level foundation for the Messiah. And God needed to raise it to a national level. Because otherwise, all the various nations that don't, aren't aware of God's providence and aren't really having a relationship with God, you know, fallen nations, you could say, nations on, nations on Satan's side, would just utterly obliterate that one family. So God needed to raise a nation so for the Messiah to come. But as we'll see, God's efforts to give Jesus the clearest path possible, it really didn't work out because there were little bits and things that happened along the way and it accumulated so much that by the time Jesus finally came, several hundred years later, the nation state of Israel, God's chosen nation, was just an occupied province by the most powerful empire of the world, Rome. So it didn't work out as God planned, but God never gives up, and that's what we're going to see today. And just some biblical context of why Moses is this prefigure to, the, to Jesus, there's a quote in Acts chapter 3 where it says, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up. You shall listen to him in whatever you do. And this was Moses speaking at the time. And we see these three central figures have a lot of parallels. For example, and there's eight that the divine principle points out. They all had a life or death situation. They all had conditions in their life symbolizing both their bodies and their spirits. When they died, each of their corpses was sanctified in some way. Uh, we talked about this yesterday, but central figures often repeat the same numerical period. And the same thing with Jacob, Moses, and Jesus. They all had mother-son cooperation in their lives. Jacob and Moses had symbols of the Messiah throughout their course in their life. Each of them journeyed from a nation on Satan's side back to God's nation, Israel. And they all, in some form, defeated Satan. Jacob in symbol, Moses in image, Jesus substantially. And we learned yesterday that by the time, like 400 years after Jacob, the circumstance of the Israelites was they were enslaved in Egypt because of Abraham's mistake to not cut the dove. And it allowed Satan to invade that offering. So God needed to restore that through this period of slavery. But then after that, God wanted to call Moses to liberate the people out of Egypt and reclaim their homeland and establish a firm nation that could contend with all the other nations of the world. And the Messiah could lead that nation. But of course, we need that foundation for the Messiah on the national level. And one more thing before we go into God's first attempt. There's another quote from Exodus chapter 7 where it says, See, I make you, referring to Moses, as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. When we talk about Moses as a prefigure to Jesus, Jesus is in the position of parent as the Messiah. So Moses is in this kind of position of both parent with respect to the Pharaoh and the Israelites, but also child for the sake of the foundation of faith and substance, because the position of Abel, as we talked about, is a position of child. So with all that important context, let's dive into the story. And I'm going to read straight from Exodus, chapter 2. When she, Moses' mom, could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds at the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance, 
to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to fetch it. So the Pharaoh at the time wanted to kill all the firstborn Israelites for fear that they would rise up against him. And so Moses' his mom, in a desperate attempt to save him, cast him down the river. And he was saved by the, Pharaoh, by the, 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 do- the Pharaoh's daughter and took him under her wing. But what the Bible also says is that Moses' biological mother was hired by the daughter of the Pharaoh to be a nurse to Moses. So even though Moses was in the palace, his Israelite mother was imbuing in him the traditions of the Israelites, letting him know that you have this good life, but those are your brothers out there that are toiling away. Those are your brothers. And so Moses had this faith in God and faith in his tradition. He had love for his brothers and his people. And he was there for 40 years in the Pharaoh's palace, getting all the luxuries of the world, you know, the Pharaoh's like, favored son, all these things. And he never lost this conviction in his people. And so because of that, he established a foundation of faith where God could commence what's called a dispensation to start, meaning God's efforts to induce the people in the position of Cain, the Israelites, for the founda- to uh, restore the foundation of substance. And this was when God had Moses, when, when Moses killed the Egyptian. Now, something to point out before we go any further is that the conditional object is no longer a sacrificial offering. Why is that? Well, when Jacob succeeded in establishing the family foundation for the Messiah, he raised our spirituality to the level where we didn't need to substitute for God's word. Because that was the point of the conditional offering. It was The point of it was to substitute for the commandment that Adam and Eve should have followed. But they fell so low, they couldn't receive it. They weren't at the level where they could. But now they could. So Moses really needed to have faith and love and understanding of God's word, rather than also, in addition, having to prove it with some symbolic offering. So when Moses killed the Egyptian, God's purpose was to induce the Israelites to rally around Moses. Oh man, he's been in the palace, but he's fighting for us now. Like, let's go. This man is standing up for us. You know, we we feel inspired. We can do it too. And this was supposed to be the foundation of substance, unity and heart with their leader, Moses, so that When they left Egypt and entered Canaan, they had strong conviction in their faith, strong conviction in their leader. But unfortunately, the opposite happened. People got really scared of Moses. They were worried that their living conditions would get worse if they found out that a Hebrew killed an Egyptian taskmaster. A slave rose up against their master. They were so scared of that because their living conditions were already so bad. They didn't want it to get worse. So they spread rumors and murmurings throughout the Israelite peoples, to the point where the Egyptians eventually found out. They were, they were you know, spreading this, this loyalty against Moses so bad that it, it led to Moses having to flee Egypt entirely, meaning that he couldn't lead the people out of Israel. He had to escape his death. And so because of that, God's first attempt to lead his chosen people out into Canaan, their homeland, it didn't work out. But God doesn't give up. But because of the failure of the first attempt, as we learned, the condition of indemnity becomes greater. And so Moses had to spend another 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, holding on to his identity as an as a Israelite, holding on to his faith in their traditions. And he did this for 40 years. And in the wilderness of Midian, you know, he found a wife. He, you know, started a family. He was living a simple life, but at least, but he, but despite all this, he still had this conviction deep down to want to liberate his people. And so because of this successful foundation of faith, God could call Moses and tell him in the story of the burning bush, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Because they've endured 
an additional several years of suffering because they had no leader to lead them out. Because God chose Moses. Moses was just slightly above everyone else. And while Moses accepted the calling and he was going back to Egypt as God instructed, God tried to kill him on the journey and his wife. Why? God just called him. Now he's like, no, no, no. Uh, no go back. Like, you really want to die right now? But the purpose of that, and we see this throughout the Bible, is God tests central figures, not because he doesn't believe in them, per se. He doesn't test them because he doesn't like them. Or he, he does it to make sure we can handle the task at hand. Because in the case of Moses, he's going back to his adopted family. He has to face Pharaoh, one of the most powerful figures in the entire world at that point. Egypt was so powerful, so vast. And God knew, God knows that whatever test he gives central figures, Satan is going to throw everything he has, a lot more than whatever test God will give. Because Satan, in his mind, is thinking, there's a chance for the Messiah to come. I cannot allow that. I need to use every condition, every way to make sure that the people don't unite around Moses. I need to use every possible method that Moses feels he can't do it. But Moses passed the test, and he did so by circumcising his son, which is a core tradition stemming from Abraham's family, and is a core tradition of Judaism. So he reaffirmed his faith. He reaffirmed his resolve. He kept going to Egypt. And so because of that, God could induce the people to believe in him again, and induce Pharaoh to let his people go. And he did this through the three signs and the ten plagues. And what really struck me about Prince of Egypt, too, was that Moses had to actually watch all of this. Like, he had to watch his fellow Egyptians, who he was raised with, go through all of this. But he was so dedicated to God's will that he gave Pharaoh these three signs and ten plagues. And what's so interesting about the three signs in particular is that, remember, Moses is trying to make the path of the Messiah as easy as possible. Give as many symbols and, you know, things to recognize about what the Messiah will do. Because the first sign is when he makes a serpent, and then, of course, the magicians are like, all right, we're magicians. We'll do this all day. Here are more serpents. But in the Bible, it states that Moses' serpents devoured the Pharaoh's serpents, and they are magician serpents. And Pharaoh's like, whatever, dude. Like, go away. Like, I'm the Pharaoh. Like, I'm, I'm not listening to you. You're a Hebrew. You're technically a slave by our, by our laws. And so... The second sign is when he stuck his hand into his bosom and it became leprous. You know, really disgusting, like dead. But then he did the same thing again and it was reborn, signifying how the Messiah is going to give rebirth to humanity. That is his mission. That's why Moses is doing all this, so that the Messiah can give rebirth to all humanity. And then finally, he turns the Nile into blood, representing how we will be resurrected from the blood of death to the water of life. And water is a symbol of life and rebirth throughout the Bible. And it's important, actually, later for this lecture. But in any case, after the ten plagues and the tenth plague being, God sends an angel of death, kills all the Egyptians, uh, firstborn sons. Pharaoh's finally like, just go. I can't believe, I don't know why your God is real, I don't know how. I thought I was the God of the world, I thought I was Pharaoh. Just go, take your people out. You screwed up my plans, get out. And God did this actually for a reason, because he, made, he wanted to make sure that the Pharaoh wouldn't, you know, go after them after they left Egypt. And, you know, they, they did in the end, because Moses had to part the Red Sea for them to escape Pharaoh's army. But he hardened, God hardened Pharaoh's heart so much that after that incident, Pharaoh never went back to go fetch the Israelites, to fetch back his slaves. No, he was so done with the Israelites. He just let them go after the incident of the Red Sea. But he also did this not only to cut Pharaoh's attachment off from the Israelites, but to cut off the Israelites' attachment to Egypt. And as we'll see, this, it doesn't work. You'd think that they've been slaves for 400 years, and they want nothing to do with Egypt. But we're going to see, once they go into the wilderness, they think, oh, you know, at least we had shelter of some sort. At least we had food of some sort. Now we have no shelter, no guaranteed water. And like, we have to like rely on miracles to get food. But these three signs and ten plagues, nonetheless, allow 
the Israelites to believe in Moses. It gets the Israelites to believe in Moses. So Moses takes them, the Bible says, 600,000 people out of Egypt, and they cross the Red Sea. But they don't go the direct route to Canaan. The direct route would have been 21 days, you know, three weeks. But because they lost faith in God's first attempt, God was worried that they would lose faith along the journey. They worried that they would rebel against the central figure. So this is why God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is why God took them on a 21-month detour. Because by the detour, they could avoid the Philistines, which in the Bible are these very powerful uh, group of Canaanites. And God was so worried that if they saw them, they would turn back to Egypt immediately, fearing for their lives. But one other reason for this is that, like we talked about, when you fail on the first attempt, the second attempt and other attempts require greater indemnity. So to show their faith in Moses, to restore their fallen nature, it couldn't be done in a short amount of time. They had to prove that they could do it sustained amount of time. So that's why it took 21 months. And another contingency God gave, he gave so many contingencies, it's actually unbelievable. Like when I was preparing for this lecture, I'm like, oh, he did this, that, the other thing. So many things to make sure that the Israelites wouldn't lose faith, or if they did, God could still use them. And this is why, after complaining a bit, and Moses saving them from their thirst and complaining through striking the rock at Horeb, God has Moses take them to Mount Sinai, where the Israelites receive the tablets of stone and the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred objects in the Jewish faith. Now the question is, why did you go to a mountain to get me this stuff? Because the tabernacle, remember they're in the wilderness, they're carrying all their possessions, all their cattle, all the things to survive. God t- tells them, make this giant tent, this giant sanctuary that's portable, And all the Levites, you guys have to be responsible for carrying this big, huge tent across the wilderness. In a detour, mind you. It's not going straight. They're going around and around and around. Why would God have them do this? It's because God wanted to establish what's called an object of faith that the Israelites could look to. So that if they were upset at Moses or complained or murmured or disunited against Moses... If they believed in the object of faith, it could be equivalent. Now, how is it equivalent? How is an object equivalent to a person in terms of reversing fallen nature? To understand this, we have to know what the tabernacle even means. But to understand that, we have to fast forward a few hundred years to what the temple is. Because God's will after the Israelites enter Canaan is to build this temple, this sanctuary, this amazing place where God... God's glory can be known, and they can worship there and do you know, the, the rituals that Israelite law requires there. And then in the Gospels, Jesus is, in his, in his preachings, claiming that he is the embodiment of the temple, and we are supposed to be engrafted onto him as his branch temples. So the temple is this symbol of the Messiah, Jesus says. Jesus says, the temple is a symbol of me. It's a symbol of how... All of humanity will come with me to finish what Adam and Eve could not. Because that's the whole purpose of all this. These details are very important, but it's not it, it's important to remember the chief, you know, picture here, which is to fulfill the three great blessings and the purpose of creation by following the model of the Messiah. So the tabernacle served the same purpose as the temple. It was the portable sanctuary where it was said that the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant is where God would sit directly and be there. And because we know the temple is a symbol of the Messiah, and this tabernacle serves the same function as the temple, the tabernacle is a symbol of the Messiah. Now, what's in the heart of the symbol of the Messiah? The Ark of the Covenant which holds these two tablets of stone, which are the tablets of stone that God gave Moses, which inscribed the Ten Commandments and the Jewish law, the chief basis for the Jewish faith. Now, in the Gospel of John, it points out very clearly that Jesus is the embodiment of the Word. 
And the word was God, as John states in the first chapter. So in, what is inside this symbol of the Messiah? It's another symbol, a more internal symbol of the Messiah. These tablets of stone. But it's not just one tablet, it's two tablets. Because what's the Messiah supposed to do? It's to find not just, not just do it himself as an ideal man, but find an ideal woman, find an ideal spouse. Because only then can this four position foundation really be restored, really be able to be created in the ideal that God intended. And it's done so, it's done so through following God's commandment, following the word, which Adam should have done in the Garden of Eden. So, we know what the tablets of stone symbolize, Jesus and his bride, the tabernacle, the symbol of the Messiah. So if the Israelites view these symbols as a symbol of the Messiah, it's in place of Moses as the central figure. So if any of the Israelites were complaining or murmuring, if just one person treated the tabernacle and tablets of stone and exalted it and attended it, even though it was just a, like a big tent as a symbol of the Messiah, God can work through that person. And that means he's giving a contingency not just for the Israelites, but in case Moses loses faith, in case Moses slips up, which, as we've learned from history, is possible, despite the incredible faith they have. But you can't just, for example, like, let's see, I can't just hold this in front of you, come down from a mountain from it, and say, this is a symbol of the Messiah. Look at it, exalt it, clean it every day, clean it every hour. You're going to think, like, what is this guy doing? Like, he came down from the mountain for this? I mean, sure, it's like a little noise, but you could just say it's a baby battle. But that's why you need to have something to recognize it as a symbol with. In other words, there has to be a reason why you view something as a symbol. And so this is why it needs a foundation itself. It needs... The tabernacle needs something... It, it, how do I... Bleh. People need to recognize it as a symbol. And they can't just do it by you telling them. There has to be a reason why, an event why. Which is why God had Moses and the Israelites create a foundation for this tabernacle. To secure it as a symbol. To secure it as the object of faith. So, it's kind of like, within this second attempt, there's like... Three separate times that God tries to establish this object of faith as a contingency for the Israelites so that they lose faith in Moses, at least they have an object of faith as something that represents their ideal and what they're building towards. Because that's the hope of God's providence, to send the Messiah. So this is why God has Moses go to Mount Sinai, up a, go climb the top and fast for 40 days. And while he's on the mountain, God, it says in the Bible, is inscribing directly the law on the tablets of stone. But while he's up there, the Israelites are like, uh, why are we at this mountain? Where did Moses go? He's done nothing for us. We're hungry. We're thirsty. Let's build a golden calf and say, this is the God that led us out of Egypt. This is the God that saved us. And he told you know, Aaron, Moses' right-hand man, they convinced him to make it for them. And then Moses comes down and he's like, are you kidding me? I fasted for 40 days and you built a golden calf. You abandoned God already. You just were freed from Israel. And he takes the two tablets of stone and smashes the golden calf, smashes it out of pure rage and anger. You can't believe that the Israelites did that. They can't believe they thought that a calf saved them out of Egypt, that the calf sent the angel of death into, the, into Egypt, that a calf parted the Red Sea. He couldn't believe that. And so he told the Israelites, anyone who doesn't come towards me and believes in me right now will be slain. And that's exactly what happened. He had all of the people that went towards him smite and kill all of the Israelites who refused to believe in him. Because this was such a danger. This was such a danger for God's providence. Because if the Israelites aren't believing in God at all, they're not going to believe in Moses. They're not going to... Think of a symbol of the Messiah, the tabernacle. They're not going to go towards this goal. They're going to go back from where they came from. They're going to go backwards. But because of this, 
There was no foundation of substance, and Moses had to do the same thing again. Go up to the mountain, fast for 40 days. And this time, I'm, the Israelites were faithful, because they was like, oh my God, this guy is a crazo. He might kill us. Let's just, let's just wait. Let's just wait. Like, anything's better than what Moses did. But because Moses destroyed these, the golden calf with the tablets of stone that were supposed to be the symbol of Jesus and his bride, this time, as a condition of later indemnity, he had to write it on the rock himself. And God actually didn't really want Moses to destroy the golden calf with this symbol, because it was inscribed by God. It was a, supposed to be a symbol for Jesus and his bride. So Moses had to make up for that. But like I said, this time, the Israelites were probably scared out of their pants, and they, when Moses came down, they were faithful. They stopped the complaining, it seemed, for a bit. And they actually built the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, exactly according to God's instructions. And when you read the Bible, these instructions are very detailed. The length, the width, what kind of gold, what kind of material, where are we putting this and that. And they followed all of it to the letter, actually. And because of that, they could begin the foundation of substance. But, like I've mentioned before, because they didn't have faith the first time, you can't just say, oh, we built it. Okay, great. Foundation of substance achieved. We reversed our fallen nature. No, 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 no. In, in our, in, when we look at our lives, we know that we can be inspired for a day or even a week, but then something will happen or we're, something's not going our way, and we'll revert back to our fallen proclivities, our fallen natures. And so God has to make sure they don't do that. But... Unfortunately, they do. The Israelites throughout the journey complain a lot. They murmur a lot. They're frustrating Moses. God's getting really upset at them because all he wants for them is to be, I mean, he, God is calling them to be like his chief people because they're, he wants them to be the closest out of everyone in the world towards him. So it's very frustrating for God. It's very frustrating for Moses too because this is what he wants for his people. He wants them to be happy live prosperously, not stuck in the wilderness. But because Moses is exalting the tabernacle as this object of faith, remember, this is the contingency. God can work again. And so, <coughs> this is why God, because Moses is maintaining this foundation of faith, faith throughout the wilderness, God could try again to lay the foundation of substance through the, through the tabernacle. And this is when Moses tells 12 spies, one from each tribe, to spy out Canaan in the book of Numbers. Spy it out. See where the defenses are. Let's plan to go to Canaan. It's exciting, right? They can finally go to their homeland, potentially. But although two spies, Joshua and Caleb, give a really faithful report, they say, yeah, they have this, they have that, they're big, they're this. But we got God, we got the tabernacle, we've had so many miracles, like the Red Sea being parted, like water coming from the rock at Horeb, like the getting this tabernacle and the tablets of stone. We've had all these miracles. God's going to give us a victory. We got this. But unfortunately, even though they give a faithful report, the other ten not only give like a, why do we come here, kind of let's go back kind of report, they made they stood up the entire camp against Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. They stood them up. They're like, Who, why is he leading us? Why are we stuck in the wilderness? Why, like, what is God thinking? These Canaanites are going to kill us. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt? At least we had guaranteed food and shelter. At least we had comfort in, the, in a sense of like a routine. But they're in the wilderness. They don't know where they're going. It's, they're wandering in the wilderness. Really tough. But it gets so bad that they all, the whole Israelite camp, attempts to stone Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Stone their leader. And then God, having enough, appears in the camp and says, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me, in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? And then he says that for every day you spy a year, you will have to spend in the wilderness. For every day you spy a year, because... They completely disunited with Moses to the point where they wanted to kill him. 
So God couldn't work. There was no possible way. Even if Moses still exalted the tabernacle, if he were dead, it wouldn't be possible. So God's second attempt ended in such tragic failure, not just because God had to wait longer, but because the Israelites who left Egypt, at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness, most of them are going to die there. They're going to die in the sand. They're not going to be in the land of milk and honey. <coughs> they won't be, because they have to endure this greater period of indemnity, because Satan has entered the camp so many times. He has so many ways to work at this point, that it needs God needs 40 more years to kind of release the Israelites from Satan's hold on them. And so there's another foundation of faith needed. And Moses is still unwavering in his faith. He is still dedicated, man. He is, I mean, think about it. He spends, yes, 40 years in the palace, you know, maybe with some internal turmoil. And, you know, you know he does have some external luxury. But then he spends 40 years in the wilderness of Midian. He has to hear these complaining Israelites for 21 months. And then God tells him, yeah, you're going to have to deal with that for 40 years. Like, oh my gosh. He is so unwavering. He's so loyal. He really wants to see his people succeed. But at some point, we all break. And this is what happened to Moses. At the end of the 40 years, he established his foundation of faith. God wanted to do another dispensation to start. I mean, he wanted to induce the Israelites to enter Canaan. And by this time, it was mostly the second generation of Israelites, the kids of the Israelites that left Egypt. And most of the original Israelites who left Egypt, they died. And so they're complaining still, though. The Israelites are still complaining. But God wants to try again, give them another miracle to save them and remind them that, hey, I, am your, I led you out of Egypt. I gave you the tabernacle, the tablets of stone. I gave you the law, all these things. And so God has Moses go to Kadesh. I, how do I spell that? Kadesh Barnea to bring forth water, water from a rock so that the people are saved by the water of life. That they're saved from their complaining. They believe in God again. And Moses does what God asks. He's beginning to strike the rock. But as he's doing so, the people are complaining still. They're like, oh my gosh, why are we here? Oh my gosh, bring me back to Egypt. Bring me back to Egypt. We've been wandering for so long. I mean, why? I mean, the second generation of Israelites, I mean, if you think about it, they technically didn't complain before, but now they're complaining. And... He strikes the rock twice out of rage and anger at the people's complaining. And the God, right after, in Numbers chapter 20, tells him, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. You're not, you're going to die in the wilderness. How? He spent like 120 years of his life trying to get them into Canaan. Why is God telling him he can't enter? Why is striking this rock, yes, out of anger, so, but you know he's still doing what God said. Why is it such a big problem for God? And we have to go back to when God gave the symbols of faith because these symbols of faith only came after they believed again after Moses brought forth water, water at another rock, the rock at Horeb. And as we've talked about, water is a symbol of life, of rebirth. And in Corinthians chapter 10, there's this really peculiar verse where it says, And did all drink the same spiritual rock? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. This rock is an internal root of getting this symbol of the Messiah. It was through their faith in the, in the saving of the water of life from the rock at Horeb, that they were able to receive these objects of faith. And so because of this rock is this kind of internal root of the Messiah, the origin of it, and we know the origin of the Messiah is God. It's from God's lineage, not shackled by Satan, so that we can model him. 
When he strikes the rock a second time out of anger, he's not in God's position. It's not like God sending the Messiah. Because remember, it said, I, the Bible said I will, to Moses, I will make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother shall be your prophet. Moses was in this position of parent and child. He, it was almost like he was giving the Israelites this rebirth, very symbolically, of the Messiah like saving them from their complaining. Because remember, God's trying to use Moses to create the clearest path for Jesus. And this is why Jesus tries desperately when you know, preaching to reference all these events that happened in Israel. You know, I am the water of life, all these things. Uh, referencing how the rock was Christ. Um, he has this another verse where he says, you know, just like the serpent in the world, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He references it because God was trying to create the clearest path for Jesus, but in the end, it created many, many, many ways Satan could interfere with the Messiah. Because if Satan claims these symbols and kind of claims parts of the path, it's like kind of like there's a path, right? And you want the hiking trail, like a hiking trail. You want the hiking trail to be clear so you don't trip and fall, but Suddenly, like, people stop taking care of the path, or people are dirtying it up, or, like, people are, like, driving on it. Like, I don't know how hiking trails get ruined, but, like, there's a bush here, and, like, there's roots here, and you're tripping, and you're trying, and the rocks are all over the place, and it's like, oh, my gosh, am I going to twist my ankle while hiking? I thought this was just supposed to be fun. That's kind of what happened with the this journey of the Israelites, the path that God was trying to create got really thorny and messed up. And this striking the rock twice, striking this symbol of the Messiah, this rebirth that he'll give a second time, it's almost like you've been given the Messiah, but now Satan's going to strike him and take him away. And as we'll see this afternoon, this is a big, big problem for Jesus. It really screws up what he's trying to do. And another thing, right after this, right, because even though Moses was told he can't enter Canaan and that he messed up, he's, his faith didn't change at all. He still was leading the Israelites. He was still doing his best. But later, the Israelites complained again. And this time, like in the spying mission, it got so bad that the camp turned on Moses. And it, the Bible says that Satan entered the camp. And that's symbolized by the fiery serpents entering the camp, biting and killing many of the Israelites. And then Moses gets a staff of a bronze serpent and tells the people, if you touch this bronze serpent, this restored serpent, this, you know, us as fallen people, right, being restored to good people, if we, if you touch it, you will be saved. And then Jesus later says in John chapter 3, just like, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Satan claimed another way for, for him to try and attack the Messiah later on. And the divine principle even goes so far as to say that this incident of the fiery serpents and striking the rock twi uh, twice are the chief reasons why Jesus later had to endure the path of the cross. The divine principle goes that far because God is trying to lay the best path for Jesus possible. He's trying to make the best way. So if Moses left his position, who could stand in the position of Abel for the foundation of substance? Who could lead the people into their promised land, Canaan? Well, yes, Moses was faithful, but there were also two other people that were faithful. Joshua and Caleb, they gave the faithful report. And the Bible says that once Moses died, Joshua took Moses' place. One of the 12 spies from uh, the spying mission. And he inherits the foundation of faith because he was following the law. He was worshiping and exalting the tabernacle, following the law and the tablets of stone. And this time with Joshua, this new generation of Israelites follow him and unite with him. When, God, when Joshua says, cross the Jordan River, they do so. When he tells these 12 tribal leaders to place 12 stones and you know, put them at the bed of the river, they do so. When he tells, uh, have any of you seen Veggie Tales, the the Jericho one? Like, it's pretty, it's a pretty popular one. They they march around the wall with the trumpet, right? Joshua tells them to do this for seven days, and the people don't question. They do so. 
And so finally, on the seventh day, when they're marching around the walls of Jericho with the tabernacle, Joshua says in chapter 6, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the Israelites poured into Jericho, and we took their homeland. And the Bible says that they defeated 31 kings altogether. And so because of this, finally, there was a foundation of substance. And God could finally give a national foundation for the Messiah. Let's give Joshua and the Israelites a round of applause. Finally. I mean, oh, all of this, all this detail, all these contingencies, all these things going on. But at the end of the day, this is God's hope. God's hope is to give the best for the Messiah so that we also have the best methods and ways and circumstances and environment to accept the Messiah so that we can be good people ourselves. But as we'll find out, this cycle of complaining and murmuring and, and you know losing faith and then being saved again, but then going back down that path and up and down and up and down, it happens throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And it gets to the point where when Jesus comes, this national foundation is almost like eroded to just a province in the Roman Empire that the Israelites control, Judea. So from all this, what can we learn? The first thing that stands out to me is that God never gives up. He will not give up. He'll always try to find someone he can use. He'll always try to uh, be there for the people. He's always going to be there for us. Even if we keep repeatedly forgetting about him and substituting him for a golden calf, right? But even though God never gives up, we have a portion of responsibility. If we don't recognize God, or, you know, we're not understanding what's going on, and, you know, we aren't able to reverse our own personal fallen natures, God's providence will have to be prolonged. His plan for us isn't going to work at that time, because there are things within ourselves holding us back. So we have a portion of responsibility. And we also learn that God tests central figures, but with a big caveat, not because he doesn't like us, because he wants us to do the best job. He wants to um, make sure we can handle the mission for our own sake. And then the last two big takeaways, and I think many people take away from the story, is don't complain. Sun Young's dad, when he teaches divine principle, and he teaches Moses' course, he, he goes off on complaining. He's saying, don't complain. No matter what, no matter your circumstances, don't complain. But it's so true because if we complain, we aren't able to view from an internal perspective. Because from an external perspective, I mean, my God, like, they go from slavery to like, going around in circles in the desert with no shelter, they have to have miracles for water and food. And, and this guy is like almost like a dictator if you look at it from an external perspective. It's like, oh, like Moses is telling us all what to do. Like he's telling us who's going to live or die depending on if we believe in him. Like, my God, like what is this guy doing? And he came from the palace. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, he must not understand us at all. Like there's so many things from an external perspective. We can look at Moses and be like, huh, is, is this really the best God has? Like. But from an internal perspective, all this is going on. All of God's effort, all of his investment, all of Moses' effort and investment, all of the Israelites' hopes and dreams are rooted in this. But if we complain, then we lose sight of that, and we're not proactive. And when we do that, we can't look from an internal perspective, and we can't hear and discern what God is trying to tell us. Because the divine principle makes it very clear. We need to be truth seekers. We need to seek the spirit and truth. Seek guidance from God through prayer, meditation, life of faith practices. But also through the, the word. What is God telling us in the law? What is he telling us in scriptures? What are the prominent figures in history telling us about how to be a good person? But if we are merely an external perspective, then we can delve pretty easily into complaining. I mean... Driving, oh my god, like, if you do it for eight day, eight hours a day, like, 
the, the things to complain about add up, and then at, towards the end, you just can't help yourself. Like, oh my god, like, you come here. Ah, ah. Like, old man grouchiness. Uh, but, but from an internal perspective, it's like, at the end of the day, is this really that important? Like, they didn't hit me, that was nice. Um, I should be, you know, maybe, you know, listening to podcasts that better my growth, which is what I do in the car, I try to. Like listen to things that help my growth, you know. Use this work and this driving, which can get annoying at times, to grow myself and be proactive, rather than just focusing on the negative and the external. And, you know, let's face it, it was super hard for the Israelites to do this. I mean, look at their circumstance. I mean, they're slaves and then they're in the wilderness. I mean, I mean, I think of myself in that position, I was like, I'm about to go to another country. Like, if I'm Egypt, I'm, I'm, I'll risk it myself. Like make stupid decisions like that, but I really feel that through studying most of this course, we can learn a lot about the importance of internal perspective, not complaining, and how our efforts and the little things that happen matter. You know, while these little things like, um, like, I don't, like, like the tablets of stone, maybe it was like, oh, this is cool back then. I mean, even now it's like, you often don't recognize how important things are when they're given to us like, like presently, you know? But then later we look back and we're like, oh wow, like that was really important, that was really meaningful. And yeah, so thank you for listening. I hope that I wasn't too intense, but <laughs> Moses is, was an intense guy, so I don't know. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>